What do you expect when you play a mainline Super Mario game? I'm not talking about the RPGs or the party games or the sports games. I'm talking about the main series platformers. Your Super Mario Brothers 1 through 3, World, 64, Sunshine, Galaxies, Odyssey. Because in my opinion, what you get in those games is what you get in the Super Mario Brothers movie. And while most Mario fans will tell you that the movie is perfect, some of us agree that the movie had a glaring flaw. The story wasn't great. I do have other grievances with the movie too, such as the unnecessary licensed 80s music and some of the voice acting being a little bit mm -hmm. But I can chalk that up to being unrelenting Hollywood interference. I doubt Miyamoto or Koizumi were pressuring Illumination to add AHA's take on me during the sequence where Swanky Kong drives Mario, Peach, and Toad through the Jungle Kingdom on a go-kart. And don't get me wrong, dude, I love Mario games across the board. It's not like I don't understand that the Super Mario series requires a bunch of suspension of disbelief and is typically very light on story, but I feel like when we're talking about a movie, it's very different. Originally, I felt like the movie was just like the games. It's colorful, fun, has great music, it's exciting. But then I realized that it was more like watching someone play a Mario game. But even then, I felt like that wasn't exactly accurate either, because when you watch someone play something, there's an investment in the player to do well, you know what I mean? Whether it's a speedrunner or a casual player, the crux of Mario games is player experience, which makes sense because that's how the games are designed. You know those auto Mario levels from Super Mario Maker? The movie's kinda like that. Sure, it's cool to watch, and there was a lot of effort put into making them work, but it sort of doesn't function in the medium that it's designed for. Like, granted, the point of video games and movies is to entertain, and both Auto Mario levels and the Mario movie are entertaining, but like I said, there's something missing. Even the most bare-bones visual novel games require user interaction, but you don't really play an Auto Mario. Similarly, if you're watching a movie, you'd at least expect what you're sitting down to watch to have some sort of arc that resolves. And I get it, is this dumbass Mexican boy really gonna bitch about the story contained in the Super Mario Brothers movie? Can't you just shut off your brain and enjoy the pretty visuals and excellent soundtrack and copious references to the Mario series as well as other Nintendo games from the 80s? And trust me, yeah, I did every time I watched it, but here's the thing. I think that what bothers me about this story is that it should have been the easiest thing about this movie to put together, and I feel like it messes it up by sometimes focusing on the wrong things, having pacing all over the place, and not really, I don't know, being about anything? And I say that because when you think about it, what are most Mario games about? Princess Peach gets kidnapped by Bowser, and the Mario brothers have to rescue her, thereby protecting the Mushroom Kingdom by proxy. You don't really need an arc because the point is the interactivity of the video game, with progression being denoted by the worlds you visit, the bosses you defeat, and the variety of enemies you encounter. You are Mario. The experiences matter because you're in control of them. You beat Bowser. You save the princess. The Super Mario Brothers movie is about two Italian-American brothers who start a plumbing business in Brooklyn who are struggling to find work while everyone gives them crap about their new endeavor, despite them being kinda competent at it, attempting to prove themselves by fixing a flood that is more the responsibility of their city's government than it is theirs as individuals, who then randomly find a giant magic pipe in the city's sewers that take them to a strange fantastical world where the two then get separated with one getting kidnapped by the movie's primary antagonist and the other arriving in a kingdom of mushroom people who then meets the kingdom's princess who is hell-bent on defending her kingdom from the main antagonist and then has to train the main character because he was told that it's very possible that his brother's been kidnapped, but that in order for them to be able to combat the main bad guy's army, they then need to request that a kingdom of apes lend their army to the cause, but then the plumber has to fight the king ape's son, and then they go ride go-karts on a rainbow to fight the bad guy, but then the bad guy's forces make the main character and the prince ape get separated from everyone else, and so the princess goes back to her kingdom to evacuate her people, and then gets strong-armed by the bad guy into marrying him, because this whole time he's been insecure about this plumber dude that he's never met, cucking him, and ruining his chance at getting with a woman that obviously has no reason to like him, and then the plumber and ape make it back to the kingdom to take on the bad guy, all while the princess has already crashed the wedding she agreed to in order to save her people, so then the main character turns into a raccoon bear that can fly, contributes basically nothing to the fight against the bad guy, but the bad guy is so jealous about this person that hasn't even really slighted him, causing him to then try to nuke the kingdom, which the main character stops by poking the nuke in the eye, and proceeds to redirect it toward the pipe that he and his brother- oh yeah, his brother is safe now because the ape prince saved him from being sacrificed for the wedding, but the main character redirects the nuke to the pipe, which then causes the pipe to start sucking everything up, so then they end up back in Brooklyn where the main antagonist starts beating the ever-loving shit out of everyone, after which the princess then tosses a very important item that never did anything up until now to the main protagonist, and he and his brother team up to beat the main bad guy, and now Brooklyn loves them. Also, they end up living in the princess's kingdom but still work as plumbers in Brooklyn for whatever reason. Like, what the fuck happened to the story of the two brothers that just wanted to start a plumbing business?
There's a presentation by Matt Stone and Trey Parker, the two dudes who created South Park, and Parker details a very simple story structure that they try to capture for every episode to make each one feel cohesive, no matter how batshit they end up being. Did my summary of the Mario movie's plot feel like things were just sort of happening one after the other? Yeah, that's because they kinda do. Trey suggests that you should never make scenes follow an and then structure because that creates a disconnect between the scenes. Instead, each story beat should be followed by either but, because, or therefore. And while the Mario movie does have a fair bit of instances where something in the story happens as a consequence of something else, I'd argue that most of the movie is just random event after random event that is either not relevant to the rest of the movie or never resolves in any way. I don't care that the main antagonist is a giant fire-breathing turtle or that there are talking penguins and mushroom people and Seth Rogen monkey with a red tie or nihilist talking puff star that awaits the sweet embrace of oblivion that will one day meet us all. All that is perfectly fine because this world is supposed to be fantastical. Beyond that, the movie doesn't really feel like it has a theme other than Mario because who the hell doesn't know Mario? Let me use the Detective Pikachu movie as an example, because Pikachu and Pokemon are probably the closest to Super Mario in terms of popularity and mainstream recognition, alongside how a licensed property got turned into a feature film. Imagine if that movie was just Ryan Reynolds as a Pokemon trainer's Pikachu, defeating all the gym leaders and we see all the Pokemon, and then Pikachu and his trainer defeat the Elite Four, eventually the champion, maybe sneak in the story of Team Rocket and Mewtwo, but the story started out as a trainer losing his father in the war or whatever the fuck. It'd probably be a really entertaining movie, but my point is, they didn't do that. They actually crafted a story set in the Pokemon universe with references that longtime fans can appreciate, but that even if you've somehow never heard of Pikachu or Pokemon before, is still a story that can stand on two feet as a competent narrative. It starts off with a concept that remains relevant throughout the course of the story, which to a degree pays off at the end, with themes that tie into each other strewn throughout the movie. And whether or not you enjoy the film or think it's a good movie isn't exactly my point. My point is more so that it does its job as a standalone narrative that can be approached by longtime fans and newcomers. The Super Mario Brothers movie feels like if you asked an AI to play every single Mario game and make an origin story out of that. And before I get into my rewrite, I want to make it perfectly clear, I do not hate this movie. Hell, I enjoyed watching it. And it's not that I think this movie is bad, it's just that I felt it lacked any sort of substance because they didn't know how to turn a conventional Mario game into a story that could fit into a certain runtime. There's damn near 40 years worth of history to showcase, so I'm sure they had to be very particular when it came to deciding what story to tell, but it's not like it should have been that hard to come up with something better. And here's the thing too, this is a film adaptation. It doesn't have to strictly adhere to how things are in the game, and I think that's why I love the opening sequence so much. Almost everything up until Mario and Luigi go into the green pipe that takes them to the Mushroom Kingdom, I enjoyed. I say almost everything because, well, okay, let's get into the rewrite and I'll explain as we go along. So the movie opens up with a scene from the very first trailer we got, with Bowser and his Koopa Troop invading the Snow Kingdom and absolutely destroying it, taking the Penguin Superstar. The whole sequence is gorgeous, amazing, the music is phenomenal, it manages to still be funny despite that, it's a damn near perfect sequence. But you might notice that I called the item a Superstar, which is the item you collect that turns you invincible in the games, better known as Starman, which is something that comes into play at the end of the movie. It wasn't made clear till then, but up until I watched the movie, I thought Bowser had stolen a power Power Star, which are the collectibles from Mario 64 in the Galaxy games, especially because that's where the penguins made their debut, and it would make sense for Bowser to be collecting multiple of them, invading and destroying different kingdoms as he goes. Not that it's super important, but why specifically does the Snow Kingdom have a superstar? Does no other kingdom have one? It seems like a really rare item, but it's also a power-up, so I'm sure Bowser could have found one somewhere else. In turn, if it's a power star, it would make sense for Bowser to have to attack the penguins because in our version, each kingdom would have one. Of course, at this point, we don't really know that yet, but maybe Bowser could hint at it by saying that he's finally found one, or maybe that he's found another one, hinting at the fact that he's already invaded other kingdoms since we later see all the prisoners he has. From here, we transition into the SMB plumbing commercial with the Super Show reference, and I wouldn't change a thing about this. This is perfect. This is beautiful. I love the cheapness. I love the fact that Chris Pratt and Charlie Day are actually doing their best Charles Martinet impressions. I especially love the actress that is reading her lines off of a cue card. That cracks me up every time. 
I also love the Super Mario World reference with the capes while they're laying on stools that they couldn't key or mask out. But my favorite part of it all is what happens afterward, when they're discussing whether or not the accents were too much for the commercial, which is when we get the Charles Martinet cameo as Giuseppe, a character who looks a lot like Jumpman playing an arcade game called Jumpman. I was pretty surprised to see the cameo happen so early on in the movie, because usually that's something reserved for the end to make it extra special, but it weirdly works on so many levels in this scene. Because Martinet is still playing Mario in this movie in some capacity, doing his Mario voice, with the purpose of encouraging the actual Mario and Luigi regarding the use of their accents, which is based on his performance as Mario. It's kinda nuts how multifaceted the joke is, and is honestly one of my favorite parts of the movie. Anyway, during the sequence, we can see that Mario and Luigi are at a pizzeria, Punch Out Pizza, which is pretty cute since Little Mac is also a New Yorker, just like the brothers, and I love seeing all the references to another series I love. And it's here where we meet a rather obscure character, one who I was surprised to find out was in the movie when it was first formally announced, Foreman Spike. Now, what I love about Spike's inclusion in this movie is that it highlights just how new this plumbing endeavor is for Mario and Luigi, presenting to the audience that they used to work as part of his wrecking crew. It not only serves as a great reference to a not-so-popular game, but also helps helps contextualize where we're starting in the brothers' story, fresh off the heels of a job they didn't want to work anymore and into their own business. I've gone back and forth on whether or not I like that their mother has been the only person that's called them, just because I feel like it's a little too sad, but I think it also perfectly exemplifies how difficult it's been for them to get their business going and why the commercial we saw was necessary. So when we get a call from their first actual client, it really does feel exciting to go with them on their first job. And this next scene is why I say that the opening act is almost perfect. The scene with the dog is the most illumination-ass part of the movie. Not only do I not like the dog because he makes what could have been a more grounded and arguably funnier scene too over the top, he's a straight up dick to Mario and Luigi. It would have been one thing if they were jackasses who didn't know what they were doing and so the dog tried to expose them for that, but the brothers literally didn't do anything wrong! Luigi accidentally steps on one of the dog's stupid treats, which his owner dropped by the way, and the mutt has a vendetta against him. They go into the client's bathroom, do their job competently, and everything gets ruined because this son of a bitch has one less bone. Boo fucking who. This is the first major change I'd make to the movie, and it's one that I think actually helps establish a character arc for Mario specifically. Remember how I said it was sad that their mother was their only call, meaning that they hadn't booked any clients and that I couldn't decide whether or not I liked that? Well, while I do, I think we could further drive the point home that their business is struggling if they've had several failed jobs, and that's why they felt the need to make their commercial. When Spike asks if the stupid Mario Brothers have had any jobs yet, Luigi could go down the list of jobs they've had and how they've messed them up. They could even throw in some more references to other Nintendo games during this part, and with every recounting, Mario gets more and more embarrassed, begging Luigi to stop bringing up past jobs. Spike does the same thing he does in the movie, ridiculing Luigi, and Mario steps in to defend his brother, which is the first instance we see of Mario being protective of Luigi. A little detail I like about this scene is how much taller Spike is than Mario, and Luigi pointing that out, but I think it should be framed a little differently. I don't think Luigi should point out how tall Spike is, I think Spike should point out how small Mario is, and how he can't wait for these two to give up the stupid business and come back to work for him. After this whole display, Luigi's phone starts to ring and they're super excited to find out that it's for none other than Mayor Pauline. This could be their big break. Getting this job done right could put Super Mario Bros. Plumbing on the map. Not only would this give Pauline a little bit more screen time, but the stakes would be way higher. They can't afford to mess this one up. So they get there, and the place is about as nice as the house they go to in the original movie, but maybe the issue Paulina's is having is something far more complicated than a sink having a leak. Maybe it has something to do with the toilet or the shower, and then maybe it turns into a problem with the other appliances. And here's the kicker. We could somehow have it to where their failure during this last job still isn't their fault, which will be explained later on. For now, it would play out purely comedically and nonsensically, with every single pipe bursting by the end, with no idea as to how it even happened. And what's more tragic, we see how Mario and Luigi struggle to know what the problem is. We do the typical surprise reveal, with Mayor Pauline looking completely shocked and the brothers completely drenched, embarrassingly revealing that the original problem had, in fact, been fixed. The next scene where we meet Mario and Luigi's family would play out rather similarly, but with a few minor changes to strike an emotional chord with the audience. They show up with their clothes still a little damp, hanging up their hats and their gloves. Their whole family is gathered at the table and sees them in a sad state. It's a bit of an awkward moment for some members of the family, particularly the brothers' parents. It's not really established in the film which extended family members are which, not that it really matters, but I think that something else fans like to do is learn things about the characters we follow, so at the very least I drop a reference to which one of them is an uncle or cousin or whatever. We only really find out the name of certain characters during the credits, which makes it especially strange that the characters have names at all when they're never spoken in the movie. 
The uncles in particular would continue to make fun of them like in the original, but in our version, I would change who it is that gets upset about this. It would be Luigi who continuously gets more anxious at each reminder that their business is failing, purely because I feel like it's more in character for him to take it particularly rough. I get why Mario does it in the original movie, it's because he's the main protagonist, but it's a moment that feels kind of out of character when Luigi seems unbothered by the whole thing. The family would mock them about the commercial, about their outfits, about the profession they chose, and the fact that they're chasing the dream of owning a business, rather than going with the flow and sticking with their old job. Throughout all this, it is still Mario who's arguing with everyone, culminating in asking their father what he thought. Their dad isn't a jerk, but he is concerned about his kids, and so agrees with the others in that maybe this was a bad idea. By the way, I just found out as of the writing of the script that Charles Martinet also plays Mario and Luigi's dad, so his Giuseppe the Jumpman cameo wasn't the only one. Luigi's last straw is his father saying that Mario is bringing Luigi down for the sake of this dream. He gets up and storms out to his room. He's the one that leaves and ends up playing Kid Icarus. Or whatever other first party NES game. It wouldn't really matter which one, but I do wonder why exactly they chose Kid Icarus specifically? Maybe just because it's one of the more fantastical platformers from Nintendo? Either way, that's not too important. Luigi's the one playing the game in the room. Small little detail, I kinda wish that they had made their bedroom look closer to the one in the Mario & Luigi games. Mario is the one that comes in with Luigi's plate, and the reason I think it works better this way is because this is a simpler version of Mario saving Luigi, which will be reflected later on in the movie. As well, I think this scene could further establish the dynamic between the two. We've seen how the two want the world to see them, we see how the world actually treats them, we see how they work together as business partners, but now we get to see how they see each other and how they work together as brothers. Mario, still upset with what their father said, tells Luigi to not pay any mind to that. Luigi, on the other hand, thinks maybe he's right that they're all right. Though ultimately brave, Luigi isn't a stranger to running away from things, so I can see him trying to quit the business, especially after a blunder of this size. Speaking of size, another reason Mario's the one that storms out in the original movie is because they try to establish that he's sick of everyone telling them what they can and can't do, and that that makes him feel small. The reason this doesn't quite land the way I think they wanted it to is because here, Mario's talking about a metaphorical size, one that's in reference to how he feels belittled by everyone else. For the rest of the movie though, everyone's ragging on him for his literal size because of his short stature, but the thing is, people in the Mushroom Kingdom take him seriously and for the most part believe in him. His journey kind of ends up feeling muddled as a result because people already believe in him halfway through the movie. Really, the only people whose perception changes at the end is the city of Brooklyn and Mario's family, but by that point, I don't really think we care about what they think. And I do like the idea that Mario is insecure about his stature, but in the context of how it relates to his capabilities. A sort of, it's not the size that counts kind of thing. It just feels a little confused throughout the film. Another aspect of Mario's personality that I don't think lands very well either is one that I wish they'd focus on a little bit more. In the games, when you get a game over, do you just never play the game again? Presumably no, I assume that at some point you go back and try again, and in the movie there are certain instances where they point out how Mario never gives up, and I love that, but they do something that I thought was kind of odd in that there's only two instances where this happens. And while I actually quite like how those moments are used, once by Peach after the fight with Donkey Kong and the other by Bowser right before the final battle in Brooklyn, I kind of wish that was the main characteristic of Mario that the movie focuses on, especially because it relates to his struggle of feeling small. And this is where we come back to our rewrite. Mario is always one to tackle things head on and isn't going to give up on the plumbing business, encouraging Luigi to not do so either. And here is where I would have the first instance of Mario being told that he never gives up. Here, Mario tries to convince Luigi to think differently, that they'll spring up from this, all they need is just one good job and then they can snowball into a string of good plumbing opportunities. Luigi could point out how stubbornly optimistic Mario is, telling him that he doesn't know when to quit. Here, it's presented almost as if it's a bad thing because the whole world is practically telling them to do so. Adding this detail would also provide a more explicit three-act structure, which I'll explain when we get to the other two moments. Right after Luigi tells him this, the news broadcast that Luigi flipped over to after Mario came in catches their attention, with the same news story we saw in the original movie, with Brooklyn flooding as a result of a sewage issue. On screen, they see Mayor Pauline telling the public that everything's under control, and a citizen freaking out begging someone to save their city. Mario gives Luigi an encouraging look, which Luigi wants desperately to reject, but ends up caving, and we cut to them rushing through the city in the company van. It's kind of odd that it was heavily featured in promotional material, but that the moment they actually try to use it, it just breaks down and is never used again. I guess it did give us that cool World 1-1 reference, but I mean, at that point, why even have the van? 
We could even just get rid of the van entirely. It's not like it really changes anything in the movie anyway. The two arrive at the scene and Mayor Pauline angrily tells the two to leave, especially after their last fiasco. Mario looks over Pauline and notices that the people she hired to solve the problem aren't even looking in the right place and proceeds to identify where they should be going. Pauline is apprehensive at first, but when she sees that the people she hired aren't fixing it, she caves in and allows the brothers to do what they think is best. But if they're unable to resolve this, they can say goodbye to their business. The rest of the scene plays out normally with the brothers going into the manhole that leads to the pressure valve. My one issue with this scene is that it feels like it plays out a little too quickly. Like, the tension rises and then is immediately undercut by how quickly the valve breaks, and before we know it, they move on to the next scene. And the more I think about it, I would actually do something else in this scene that I hadn't realized before. I'd give Luigi something to do, because much like the rest of the movie, there's really no reason why Luigi's here in the first place. For a film titled the Super Mario Brothers movie, only one of the brothers really does anything. Maybe the main pipe that Mario has to cross is being sprayed by other bursting pipes that Luigi has to fix as Mario's trying to cross. I don't know, something. That way, Mario can start making his way across, maybe even like a tightrope walker, when he realizes that the valve is way too tight and needs Luigi to help him to turn it. Luigi is reluctant at first, but sees that Mario really needs his help. This could also be the first instance of Mario saying to Luigi that nothing can hurt us as long as we're together, because much like the thing with Mario never giving up, him saying that doesn't really come into play until later on in the movie, rather late actually. The two manage to turn the valve together and successfully cut the water flow, finally having a job go off without a hitch, and we cut to the streets of Brooklyn being relieved that the flood is over. That's another thing I kind of thought was weird. We never really see the aftermath of all that. All we see when they return to Brooklyn is that repairs are being made, but in the original movie, no one knows how the problem was resolved. In our version, we would get to see at least some of that, with Pauline even seeming impressed, and as Mario and Luigi celebrate this victory, the pipe they're on begins to rumble and gives way due to their weight, and the next scene with them crashing into the wall that leads them to the green pipe plays out the same way it does in the original. I'd insert a small little detail though. After the two crash into this new area, they notice that the pipe that was connected to the valve they just stopped leads deeper underground. They follow the pipe and it ends up in front of a giant green pipe. Everything seems to be wet everywhere, but the pipe doesn't seem to be connected to anything. So Mario and Luigi look around to find the water source. Luigi gets sucked in by the warp pipe and Mario follows shortly after. Here, I would make it so that Mario just barely misses grabbing onto Luigi's hand in the warp zone, if only because it's the teensiest bit weird that they're holding onto each other and then they suddenly get sucked in by different streams for no reason. Maybe the reason could be because of the rogue wrench that got sucked in before Mario did, preventing them from reaching each other and knocking Luigi into a separate warp stream. Either way, they end up heading into different pipes. Mario's arrival to the Mushroom Kingdom and meeting Toad for the first time would go slightly different. Something I thought was weird was that Mario explains the situation to two different characters and essentially gets the same response. Luigi ended up in the Darklands and is most likely going to be kidnapped by Bowser. And if Peach is going to give him that information anyway, why present it here? If anything, Toad should probably be freaking out that there's another human in the Mushroom Kingdom, presumably the first since the princess. I feel like more than anything, that should be the reason that Toad wants to take Mario to meet Peach, especially given that we see that the rest of the Toads are visibly shocked to see Mario too. We could hold off that moment by having our Toad be insistent that Mario follow him and not let him get a word in about Luigi. Speaking of Luigi, his next scene with him getting attacked by swoopers, chased by dry bones, and him running into the building surrounded by lava, mwah, chef's kiffs, love it. Except that what ends up bumming me out is what happens as a result of his capture at the hands of the Shy Guys in the one sniff it. Because that happens, Luigi's basically out of commission for the rest of the movie, and I would've loved to see a back and forth where Luigi has to go on an adventure of his own in the scary Darklands, while Mario is adventuring in the bright and fun Mushroom Kingdom. It may seem too soon, but like, screw it, right? It's not like we're following the games to a T, so I'd imagine that upon entering the building where he gets captured, he instead bumps into Professor E. Gad, who basically serves a similar function to Toad as Luigi's guide. But instead of doing a whole ass Luigi's Mansion story, let's just say that E. Gad is here as the only survivor of whatever kingdom this used to be before Bowser took over. This way, Luigi can be eased into things a little more instead of being thrown into the wolves and only learning of Bowser when they first meet. The next sequence with Toad taking Mario through Toad Town is largely fine too. My only complaint with it is that I feel like Mario should have been maybe a bit more weary of going through another green pipe given how he got here in the first place, but Toad could easily explain that away by asking Mario to trust him. That could even set up something between the two characters later. 
Especially after Donkey Kong joins the party, Toad feels like an afterthought, so it'd be nice for these two characters to establish a better relationship with each other. I do love how Buckenberry and Gold are the castle guards, but holy shit, do I hate the ham-fisted our princesses in another castle joke, especially because they insist on it. It's not like I don't like the joke, it's that I dislike how the joke was presented. Almost like, eh? Get it? We said the thing. Eh? Eh? I, I think they could still have the joke, but maybe play it a little straight, especially since these toads have no reason to be the assholes they're being. Our toad could ask them to let him and Mario through to see the princess, with them informing them that the princess is in fact in another castle to discuss the coming conflict, which sparks Mario's interest. And as he starts to question what they mean, we see that from the same pipe Mario and Toad just emerged from comes Princess Peach. Another reason I want to handle it this way is because it doesn't make sense that our toad would distract the guards at the door and then just throw Mario into a castle filled to the brim with other guards that could just as easily throw him out, making this distraction meaningless. And this part is a little important too for purely personal reasons. Alongside Peach is Toadsworth, her trusty advisor! What is it with Nintendo and the Toadsworth erasure? You made a unique toad with glasses specifically to explain Bowser's plan, and you made him a generic dude? Like, granted, it's not like Toadsworth does a whole lot in the series, but in a film that loves to celebrate Nintendo, it's weird that they decided to reference, I don't know, that hint toad? Toadbird? I don't think it's supposed to be them, so why not just make it Toadsworth, an arguably more iconic character? Anyway, we could totally keep the slow-mo scene with Mario fawning over Peach with her walking past him and the Toads, and she does the classic turn which makes Mario even more smitten, and we snap back to her plainly asking who this strange little man is. Mario introduces himself, and Peach asks from what kingdom he hails. Confused, Mario answers that he hails from Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Kingdom? She's never heard of that one. No, no, he explains that he's a human. I think there's enough plausible deniability for Peach to not assume that immediately. I think it's kind of weird that in the original movie, the only thing that makes Peach doubt whether or not Mario's a human is his size. She could point out other things too, like his nose, his outfit, but wait, what's a human doing here in the Mushroom Kingdom? This is when Mario explains everything about the pipe they found and about his brother landing in a foggy place with what looked like lava. Everyone gathered in front of the princess's castle collectively gasps. Mario looks around, concerned, and asks what was wrong. Our Toad answers that that's one of the Darklands, Bowser's territory. Mario asks who Bowser is. Peach looks at her subjects and tells Mario that it's probably best that he follow her. We cut to the scene inside the throne room and it plays out similarly to the original. Toadsworth explains that they had just returned from one of the seven star kingdoms that surround their world and now have confirmation that Bowser has destroyed the Snow Kingdom. There's a bit of restlessness within the throne room as the Toads begin muttering amongst themselves. One Toad asks what happened to all the snow after it got melted by Bowser. Toadsworth explains that while some of it made its way to the ocean, most of it was flushed down the warp pipes throughout the kingdom. They've yet to know where all that water ended up. We have a brief cut to Mario, who knows exactly where that water ended up. Another Toad looks frightened, asking if that means that- Yes! Toadsworth interrupts. That means that Bowser has secured another power star. As the Toads in the room gasp in fear, one of them calls out that that would mean that he now has three. Sure enough, on their map we can see three different kingdoms destroyed. In the original, there are six kingdoms on their map. The Mushroom Kingdom, the Jungle Kingdom, the Snow Kingdom, the Sand Kingdom, what I'm guessing are the Darklands, and what I assume is Dinosaur Land, maybe? The Bomb Kingdom? I mean, there is a King Bomb. I'm not sure, it's not clear. But Bowser's Keep is a separate roaming location. So, what exactly are the Darklands? In reality, the Darklands are probably just the Koopa Kingdom, and Bowser's Castle was designed to be able to float around separately in order to invade other kingdoms. But for the sake of our rewrite, I like to think that, much like the Snow Kingdom, the Darklands were once another kingdom that Bowser destroyed for the sake of taking their Power Star, and that Bowser's Keep counts as a kingdom all its own. That would mean that with his own Power Star, he would have destroyed two other kingdoms. Another Toad calls out that if he collects theirs, their kingdom is doomed. One of them asks their princess what they plan to do. Peach explains that she wants to take the fight to him. We get the same scene where they ask what it is they can do, they're not exactly fighters. Peach then explains that she plans on venturing to the Sand Kingdom to search for their Power Star, thought to be hidden somewhere in the desert ruins. The Toads may not be fighters, but if they have enough stars to protect them, they won't need to be. Once that's secured, she'll make her way to the Jungle Kingdom and request that the Kongs lend their Power Star and their fiercest warrior, the King's Son, in the fight against the Koopa Troop. The only reason I change it to just DK and not the whole army is because Peach is already asking for their power star, which by itself is a big ask. Asking for an entire army might come off as too greedy. All Peach needs is someone to be able to take on Bowser one-on-one. -on -one. 
One of the Toads points out that that would only mean they'd be in possession of three Power Stars as well, not enough to stop that fiend. Toadsworth speaks up and explains that he and the princess had just returned from the Dinosaur Kingdom. The Yoshi are famously close allies of the Mushroom Kingdom, and we pan to Peach presenting the newly obtained Power Star, which Mario marvels at. The star gets placed into a question mark block for safekeeping. Mario asks what happens once they get all the stars. Do they plan on just returning and waiting for this Bowser guy to attack? Peach explains that once an alliance has been made with the Kongs, she plans to infiltrate Bowser's domain. She turns to Mario and tells him that if his brother ended up in one of the Dark Lands, a kingdom ruined by Bowser, it's most likely that he'll have been kidnapped. Mario seems troubled, but jumps to say that if that's where his brother is, then he's coming along too. Similar to the original, Peach explains the reasons why that's a terrible idea. Bowser is a vicious, fire-breathing creature, someone that could devour him whole and not even notice, commanding the strongest legions of turtles the world has ever seen. Mario needs to process what you just said. Turtles? Bowser's a turtle? Toad chimes in by saying, yeah, a big scary one. Mario exclaims that he doesn't care, that he's going to help save his brother. Peach looks at him, sensing his determination, and with a sly smile, agrees. Mario confidently asks when they leave, but they're not going anywhere just yet. If you notice, that's very similar to what happens in the original, but I want to tidy up some of the dialogue and sequence of events because in the original, Mario practically has to beg Peach to let him come, she agrees, and they do that thing where a character has to confirm that something is actually happening and then is shot down in favor of something else. It's like that one scene in Shrek. Can I stay with you, please? Of course! Really? No. In our version, Mario assumes that Peach has agreed to take him with her, when in reality, all she's agreed to is testing him. She does this in the original too, but Mario's more confused if she agreed at all, and Peach has to point out that she's testing him. I hope I'm explaining what I think the difference is correctly. We cut to the obstacle course scene, but I would add a slight, yet in my opinion, significant change to it. Peach tells Mario that if he wants to save his brother and survive against Bowser, he needs to master the obstacle course, which she then proceeds to demonstrate by doing it herself. She grabs onto the flagpole and lands safely. Mario is in awe and wonders out loud how he's supposed to do that. Which, now that I think about it, is kind of a weird thing to ask, because during the World 1-1 scene at the beginning of the movie, we see Mario jumping on girders and shit, jumping onto a signpost, and I get it, maybe that's not as physically demanding as this obstacle course is, but it's not like Mario's entirely unathletic. Peach explains the use of power-ups and how they can help him be faster, stronger, jump higher. And here's the slight change I was talking about. Mario asks why it is that Peach didn't need a power-up to clear the obstacle course. After the montage in the original, Peach mentions that not everyone gets it on their first try, but it's revealed that she did, with the pretense that she was raised here, so it's only natural that she'd be able to clear it right away, which is also a weird thing to say, because I doubt most of the Toads could do what she just did, and they grew up here too. Instead, I would make it so that she explains that yes, it's because she grew up here, but that the reason she's so good is because she had a lot of time to practice, which could play into a scene later on in the movie. She explains that she needed a lot of mushrooms to get really good at it, and the rest of the scene plays out normally, with Mario having to eat something he's repulsed by. As a side note, I always thought that him not liking mushrooms in this movie was a cute little ironic joke. When asking if it had to be a mushroom, Peach answers that the mushroom power-up is the most basic one, and that he'd have a chance to use the others once he mastered using this one. I'd also keep the whole montage with Mario taking a hit over and over again, but I would make a teensy change to it. When I heard Bonnie Tyler's holding out for a hero, it hit me like a fucking brick block, so I would obviously change that to an original composition, but also somewhat importantly, I'd also make it so that halfway through the montage, Mario keeps messing it up and Peach actually leaves. I like that the princess believes in Mario, but she also doesn't have time for this. A fire-breathing dragon turtle is about to invade her kingdom. She needs protection. She appreciates Mario's help and wants him to succeed, but she has to leave in the morning. Of course, there's no dialogue through all this. We just see Peach head back on a lackey 2 cloud or something. Mario's a bit heartbroken at this, but he persists. All throughout the night, Mario finds new ways to slip up, wipe out, but he keeps trying. At sunrise, Peach looks out the window since she hears noises only to see that Mario's still going at it. She goes back down to where he was the night before, and Mario's on a good run, clearing everything like a pro. But just like in the original, he gets distracted, wants to show off, and right before he reaches the flagpole, gets chomped by a mecha piranha plant. We cut to Mario and Peach sitting on a few blocks, with Peach telling him that it looks like they're ready to go, with Mario interjecting by pointing out that he didn't make it. In the original, it was also a little weird that Peach settles for good enough, but in our rewrite, I think it could be better established that Peach sees that Mario is persistent, and that's exactly what they're going to need if they want to defeat Bowser and save Luigi. 
Next up, we have Bowser's announcement to his army that he plans to invade the Mushroom Kingdom and marry Princess Peach. And this is another damn near perfect scene. I love getting insight into what his kingdom looks like, how he treats his subjects, a band playing a scene from Bowser's Fury. I'd really only change the dialogue to suit the changes we've made, such as Bowser possessing the Power Stars as opposed to just the one superstar. They might even be able to drop a line about how there are still a few Power Stars out there, and Bowser could dismiss it by saying that once they collect the one in the Sand Kingdom, they'll have most of them, so it's not really an issue. He can't destroy every kingdom, he'd have nothing to take over. Okay, hear me out. I love Baby Mario and Baby Luigi, but this next Luigi scene was just... It didn't make a whole lot of sense to me outside of referencing the baby characters. Like, yes, I understand that it's meant to symbolize that Mario's always protected Luigi, and so Luigi's confident that Mario will save him now, but standing up to a schoolyard bully for you and saving you from whatever hellscape you're about to enter, especially when you have no idea where your brother ended up, are nowhere near the same thing. Here, we'd see Luigi getting up to speed with Igad, with Luigi asking what it is he's still doing here. And what's with the vacuum on his back? Just as he finishes the question, out pops a boo behind them, and Egad sucks it up with his trusty Poltergust 3000. Luigi is about to have a goddamn heart attack, asking what that was. Alvin just says that Luigi needs to look alive, especially if he's going to help him find this kingdom's power star. Luigi collects himself, but is confused. There's a power star here? He thought Bowser destroyed this kingdom for it. It turns out he did destroy it, but only because he could never find the thing. If they managed to secure it, they could use its power to restore the kingdom to its original state. I like to imagine the purpose of EGAD here is to provide additional context to the narrative, from what Bowser's doing to what the Power Stars can do, get Luigi up to speed with this world, etc. In the original movie, there's a scene where Peach and Mario head out into a war pipe where Peach is about to give a speech and one of the Toads asks who Mario is, with Peach saying that he's not important and yeah, neither is this scene, I'd get rid of it altogether. The only thing this scene does for me is the still frame of Peach's face. And I'm not gonna lie, the scene immediately after that one isn't too great either. Our Toad shows up, says he's going to tag along, and then Peach just... lets him. Because he's brave, I guess. I mean, Mario was too, and you were hesitant to let him come, he had to prove himself. I talked to my fiancé about the scene in particular, and she brought up the point that maybe Peach was more willing to let Toad come because he's from the Mushroom Kingdom, and I guess? But I kind of like the idea that they let Toad tag along because he has a backpack full of provisions and the means to make a camp and whatnot. He does use it in the original movie a couple of times, but it's only really evident during the scene when he helps Mario get into Peach's castle, and I think it would be more meaningful if his backpack were a bit more useful than just happening to have it when they're camping. I feel like, at the least, that should be brought up as a point as to why they should let him come. After that, we get the montage through the different Mario levels throughout the Mushroom Kingdom, and goddammit, could they have made this montage a little longer? I love seeing all these references, but I feel like we, as the audience, don't get the time to really appreciate that Mario, Peach, and Toad go on this grand adventure because it doesn't feel like one. All they do is walk through these places and don't face any adversity. The worst things that happen is that a cheap cheap sucks on Mario's face, Mario gets a little hot in Toasterena, and that climbing's a little tough on the high cliffs. That being said, I'd reserve this montage until after our next scene, which is the eligible for an Oscar nomination as of the writing of the script, and no I'm not kidding, song Peaches, which features Jack Black belting out the word bitches in the latter half until he gets interrupted by Kamek. And yeah, I love Peaches too, not Oscar nomination love it, but I do think it's a wonderfully comedic scene showcasing how much Bowser pines for Peach, his own insecurities when Kamek tells him about a mustachioed human being trained by her, and how Bowser masks those insecurities with intimidation and aggression. Something I wasn't too keen on was that after the Luigi scene, they kind of get rid of that mask entirely, making Bowser outwardly insecure and clearly threatened by Mario's existence. I guess I just would have liked it if they were subtle about how insecure he is, deflecting it with his signature rage. Bowser tells Kamek to find out who the human Peach has been training is and what they're planning to do. And I don't quite understand how Kamek got reports of this. He just shows up and says that a report from their intelligence told them, but you would think that maybe there would be a sign of this? Was it during the montage? It's not too important, but at least a scene where a Goomba or something sees Mario for the first time would be nice. There's a Twitter user by the name of Mr. Doobie who suggested that a scene be placed right here, and goddammit, I couldn't have explained this scene better myself. 
So I personally think it would be better if the montage were placed here with the princess looking out over the sand kingdom or any one of the kingdoms that would give us a better shot than the high cliffs. Like, don't get me wrong, that view would be sick to see in real life, but in this fantasy world, it's probably one of the more boring sights they could have shown us. Doobie suggests that this scene should happen in the Sand Kingdom, which is why I'm mentioning it. Mario might be dying of heat here, asking how much longer until they find the Power Star, with Peach saying that the place they're looking for isn't much farther. He asks why they couldn't have just taken a pipe to get here, but Toad explains that the ruins of the Sand Kingdom don't exactly have any functioning warp pipes. Then, as the sands on this land begin to shift, an underground temple emerges. And as the group make their way inside to secure the kingdom's power star, out come the Koopa Troop, led by the blue-shelled Koopa. And a chase scene occurs throughout the ruins of the temple, which Doobie says would help showcase Mario's new abilities, and I totally agree. It would help us see that his practice is paying off, and we could see Peach kick some more ass, especially saving Toad from harm. I imagine that the Koopas only have the block that contains the Power Star, and it could be a back and forth, with Mario and the gang kicking it back, then losing it, then taking it back again, until they exit the temple. Blue Shell catches up to Mario, and the two begin to fight. Maybe Mario could start panicking because he tries to get a power-up from a question mark block, but all he's getting are coins, just to add a little levity to this tense scene. Blue Shell starts beating up Mario, and before a final blow, Toad jumps in with his frying pan and uses it as a shield to protect his friend. Doobie suggests that it should be Peach who saves Mario, which would make more sense, but I really want more moments between Mario and Toad to strengthen their friendship. Maybe they could even reference the sports games, with Peach coming in to make the Koopa retreat into his shell and toss it to Toad who smacks it away using his frying pan as a tennis racket. Having lost the Power Star, the Koopa Troop retreat with their leader, and Mario thanks Toad, calling him friend. And now we cut to the fire flower scene, which Doobie thinks the fight scene would help complement, and I totally agree with that as well. In the original movie, I don't really like this scene, and it's not because it's bad, it's because it feels unearned, a little forced even. The primary focus of this scene is to elaborate on the fact that Peach isn't from the Mushroom Kingdom, while also assuring Mario that they'll find his brother and showing off the fire flower and what it can do. My issue with it is that it doesn't feel cohesive. In the games, yeah, we've all thought it's weird that Peach seems more human than her subjects, but it's just one of those things that we accept. If they hadn't talked about it at all, I wouldn't have questioned a thing, but now they're introducing a character detail that you would think ties into something else, and it kinda doesn't. It reminds me of Chekhov's Gun, a narrative principle named after Russian playwright Anton Chekhov that basically states that all elements in a story must be relevant if mentioned or featured, and must be removed otherwise. And while I don't entirely agree with Chekhov's own version of his principle, I think there's merit to it. For example, Peach uses a fire flower power-up to light the campfire that Toad built. Chekhov would argue that because the fire flower and what it can do is featured here as a primary focus of the scene, it should then be utilized later, and it is by Donkey Kong, but as far as I'm concerned, the flower served its purpose as something to use in the moment. They could have never featured it again, and I'd be content because, hey, they showed it off at least once. Where I do agree with the principle is when Peach goes into her backstory about being a human that randomly shows up in the Mushroom Kingdom one day. If you delete this scene from the movie, nothing changes. There was no point in having this conversation. Peach is excited to see another human, elaborates that she's not from this world, which we already knew, and then nothing. And it's not that I don't like this backstory. I actually would even add that maybe Toadsworth was the one to find her and raise her to be the princess, with Peach not remembering anything about how she got here. And maybe we could tie that into why the underground pipes in Brooklyn that lead here were walled off, to prevent Peach from being able to return to her home. But we never get any resolution to that plot point. Peach just mentions that there's a huge universe out there with a lot of galaxies, and that makes me think that this whole scene is meant to bleed into a sequel where they focus on a Mario Galaxy-esque plot where Peach is from another world entirely. But I also feel like they could have reserved this scene for that movie because it doesn't really do anything for the story right now, especially when the screen time could have been better reserved for more important scenes that are relevant to this adventure. Like, I hate to think that they couldn't give Luigi his own side plot in favor of going into Peach's non-important backstory. If we get rid of it though, Doobie does have something to replace it with that I think fits a whole lot better, even in the context of what we've written. Doobie says that this scene could be used to show how disappointed Mario is not being able to defend himself from the blue-shelled Koopa. If he can't do that, how can he hope to save his brother? And the reason that's important is because it ties directly into Mario's impulsivity fighting Donkey Kong later on, but we'll get to that in a bit. For now, we have more Luigi and Egat shenanigans, and this kind of ties back into Luigi's plot in the original movie. Exploring the abandoned castle in the Darklands, the two come across a room full of treasure, something that Luigi admires. Why wouldn't Bowser want to take any of this? Egad tells him that money means nothing to a monster like Bowser. 
It's power he wants. And as Egad's going on an anti-Bowser tirade, from behind him is a painting depicting a giant boo with a crown that slowly makes his way out from it, and Luigi is too terrified to articulate any words while Egad rambles on. I think that one of the characters this movie fails to represent correctly is Luigi. And the only reason I say that is because at the end of the movie, Peach says something about how brave Luigi is, and he responds by saying that bravery is what he's known for, which is obviously supposed to be an ironic joke, but the thing is, Luigi's cowardice isn't showcased well in this movie. He's more timid than Mario at best, and reacts the way any sensible person would at worst. I love Luigi, but I want him to be a bumbling mess when he's scared, not slightly uncomfortable. And the mere sight of King Boo should make him almost pass out in fear. Egad finally notices that Luigi looks a little off, and when turning around is captured by King Boo, putting him in a tiny cage, like the one that takes Mario to Big Boo's haunt in Mario 64. This makes Egad drop the poltergust, which Luigi picks up, shaking in his little brown boots. King Boo laughs, asking if Luigi really thinks that the little vacuum scares him. Luigi musters up the courage to turn the poltergust on, and nothing happens. Luigi flicks the switch back and forth, but nothing's happening. King Boo is laughing hysterically at this point, when Luigi whacks the poltergust and it finally activates, except it's set to blow, releasing some of the boos Egad had captured and pushing King Boo away slightly. Upon realizing his mistake, Luigi flips the switch again and starts sucking everything in the room up, in particular a large chest, but with it he sucks up all the treasure and even some of the booze. The remaining ones prove too much for Luigi, so they trap him in the cage too alongside Egad, Poltergust and all. The booze deliver the cage to the Shy Guys who board their hot air balloon and make for Bowser's Keep, and the scene from here on plays out largely the same, with the Shy Guys and the Sniffet delivering the cage as a wedding gift from King Boo. As the cage breaks, out come Luigi and Egad. Bowser recognizes Luigi as a mustachioed human, just like Kamek had said. Tied up in Kamek's magic, Luigi's asked where the princess is. Luigi doesn't know anything about a princess. That's when the blue-shelled Koopa arrives and gives his report. This was a small little thing that Doobie mentioned as well, and I think it ties in perfectly because not only does Blue Shell inform Bowser of Mario to clear up any confusion, it's happening just as Luigi gets kidnapped. He says that Mario is no threat. Well, clearly, Bowser already had him kidnapped. What do you mean, your dastardliness? Bowser shows Luigi to Blue Shell, explaining that he's currently asking the human about the princess's whereabouts. Blue Shell tells Bowser that this wasn't the human traveling with Peach. That human had red clothes, not green. Bowser looks at Luigi, then back at Blue Shell, eyes in utter disbelief. Why isn't the human here? Well, you see, sir, the princess- You mean to tell me you found the human and the princess, and you let the mustache live? At least tell me you brought the power star I ordered you to retrieve! Oh, well, you see your preemptiveness, uh, the human- Bowser shouts at Blue Shell to find him and finish him off or to bring him to Bowser. At this, Blue Shell flies off, terrified. He turns back to Luigi, and the rest of the scene plays out the way it does in the original movie. He asks him his name, except he never calls him by his name, only Green Stash, the way he does in the Mario and Luigi games. Either that, or he keeps getting his name wrong as a running gag. Bowser demands to know if Luigi knows this other human, threatening to tear his mustache off, and Luigi tries his best to deny him. The more Bowser tugs, the more Luigi admits. Yes, he knows him, it's his brother Mario, the best guy in the whole world. Bowser pulls tighter, needing to know if princesses find him attractive. And I'm not gonna lie, I thought that line, while funny, was just a little too over-the-top simping for an otherwise pretty serious scene where Luigi was already the one supplying the comedy, but I think that now that we've added a bit more seriousness to it, we can afford to escalate the comedics a little bit, really making Bowser's insecurities shine as opposed to being part of every conversation he takes part in. We still need to show that he's a terrifying king and not undercut that with his undying affection every single time. Luigi says that they do find him attractive if they have good taste, and Bowser rips a part of his mustache off, demanding that he and his strange little companion be thrown in the dungeon with the rest of the prisoners. The next scene plays out largely the same, with Luigi and Egad meeting the Penguin King in Lumalee, with maybe other characters from the destroyed kingdoms there too. Maybe one of them recognizes Egad as that crazy scientist. So next we have the scene with Mario and friends reaching the Jungle Kingdom and Aha's take on me. If holding out for a hero hit me like a brick block, take on me hit me like a goddamn bullet bill. It has nothing to do with what's happening on screen. Are you seriously telling that you couldn't get the composer to remix something from Donkey Kong Country for this? Was Illumination like, ah, oh, well shit, the movie comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow? <laughs> The movie comes out tomorrow and Brian still hasn't finished writing the music for the first scene in the Jungle Kingdom. 
fuck it. Let's just pay our awesome royalties and slap some take on me in there. Like, seriously, you could pick an 80s song and it would fit just as well in this scene. Everything in it, perfect. Probably wouldn't change a thing, except for the damn song. Hey guys, editing Chari here. So quick side note, um, I've been working on this video for months at this point, and I was debating whether or not I should include this, but back in July, it was discovered by people who had been listening to the original Super Mario Brothers movie soundtrack that certain compositions that were part of the original score lined up perfectly with some of the scenes in this movie. So it really wasn't just that I thought that, you know, the, the 80s songs were out of place. It's because they literally were not animated to the 80s songs. They were animated to Brian Tyler's compositions, and I am so pissed that we don't have a cut of this movie with those original compositions in it. I, I knew it. I knew it. Do yourself a favor and look up the scenes of this movie with the original compositions, and it, it's so much better. I wish that was the cut we had gotten in this film. So, in the original movie, they reach Cranky Kong's throne room and humbly request the aid of his army in the coming conflict. With the Mushroom Kingdom's heart and the Jungle Kingdom's strength, they can win! Cranky Kong accepts, Peach is surprised that it was that easy, and Cranky Kong admits that it wasn't that easy, that he doesn't accept. And I have to say, this exchange was a breaking point for me because it feels like such a waste of time, all for a joke that isn't funny to begin with and also isn't performed in a funny way. Instead, for our version, Cranky's heard that Peach was coming for his kingdom's power star. Peach makes the appeal, same as in the original movie, and Cranky leads her on, making her think that she's convinced him. Peach is relieved and thanks the king for his cooperation, to which Cranky starts laughing. The three travelers seem confused, and Toad asks what's so funny. Cranky reveals that he also heard a rumor that they were here to ask for his son's help in fighting Bowser's army. Peach, with her tail caught between her legs, tries to save face and explains that she was getting to that part of the request. Cranky sits up and sarcastically tells that it's a little rude to not be upfront and honest about her requests. Makes him think she has something to hide. Peach tries to dispel that assumption, but Cranky Kong interrupts her again by saying that he believed her, but in any case, he hadn't intended on just handing over their power star. They had to earn it. Defeat his son and the Jungle Kingdom star is theirs. In the original, Peach immediately excuses herself in Mario and warns him how bad an idea this is. Which is weird, because Mario hasn't even accepted the terms. All he had done was demand that they lend their army, no different than what Peach had done. So in our version, we'll have Mario step up and say that he'll take on Cranky's son for the star. To which, again, he starts laughing, as do all his guards. Something I kinda wish the original movie had done, that I'm trying to do in our rewrite, is play up how powerful a warrior Donkey Kong is. Having announced that Donkey Kong was going to be played by Seth Rogen, I think that the studio knew that we as an audience figured that Donkey Kong would be a goofy version of the character, so I don't think they exactly tried to hide it. But the thing is, Mario in particular has no idea who this guy is, so talking him up like this big, dangerous dude makes the reveal that DK is a bit of a meathead all the funnier. Cranky remarks that those are big words for someone so small. And this is where Peach excuses herself after Mario gets visibly confrontative and tells him that this is a very bad idea. The King's son is notoriously strong. Mario wouldn't stand a chance. Mario insists, saying that if he can't take on this guy, how can he hope to get his brother back? This was the other scene that Doobie had mentioned was made more significant due to Mario losing the fight against Blue Shell. He desperately wants to prove himself, another instance of Mario not giving up. Now that I think about it, I would add something else to this scene too, a small little detail. Peach should be the one to ask Cranky Kong to add power-up blocks to the arena. In the original, Cranky does it because he wants the fight to last more than 5 seconds, but it doesn't really make sense why he would give Mario a fighting chance. Instead, Peach could be the one that convinces him to do it for the same reasons. The Kongs see this as entertainment, but it wouldn't be all that interesting because of how small Mario is. Mario could get offended at that, but it's mostly played for laughs. Cranky likes the idea and tells her that she's got herself a deal. This could further show how intelligent and diplomatic Peach is, and is another way she could help Mario out. The fight against DK is another one that I wouldn't change too much, but man, some of this dialogue. Like Cranky Kong pointing out that I guess he got the wrong mushroom when Mario eats a mini mushroom. Y yeah, we can see that. Is that supposed to be funny? Like, all you're doing is pointing out something that we saw happened. Why did we need to cut to him saying that? 
Another moment I think is kind of odd is Mario slowly approaching the Fire Flower after he hits the question mark block, allowing DK to blow it out. There's one of two ways I would have preferred to see it instead. Either make Mario grab the power up and hold it up confidently, about to absorb it, and then DK blows it out for added comedic effect, or have Mario actually use the Fire Flower power up, but it ends up not working out the way he had planned because he tries to bum rush Donkey Kong instead of coming up with a strategy. He knows how to navigate an obstacle course, but he may not be that bad at using power-ups yet, not to mention that in the battle of pure strength, there's no way a human like Mario could hope to match DK's power. That way, when he does eventually get the cat suit, it makes more sense for him to be smart with it and plan ahead, rather than think that raw power is going to help him win. Throughout all this though, Mario's getting his face kicked in almost literally, but he doesn't give up, evidenced by when DK asks him if he's had enough, and Mario answers by exhaustedly saying not even close. But of course, Mario comes out on top, defeating Donkey Kong, and the crowd cheers with Cranky surprised and impressed. This next scene is also pretty good, with Peach commending Mario for continuing to get up and not knowing when to quit, mirroring what Luigi said earlier. This makes what Mario says in the original movie bear more weight. Huh. Well, never thought of that as a good thing. Because everyone's always giving him a hard time for that very reason. But now, with a few added scenes, this line gives Mario a new perspective. Donkey Kong comes out, a rivalry with Mario is established, and Cranky steps in, preventing the two from fighting again, telling Donkey Kong that he had his chance. If he had focused more on smashing instead of showboating, he wouldn't have lost the fight. DK is visibly angry at this, but Cranky shuts him down to tell everyone that he has something to show them. He takes them to a hut and presents them with their kingdom's power star, which Mario can finally admire up close. Cranky also informs them that their army has seen Bowser's fleet headed for the Mushroom Kingdom, which Toad points out is so far away that they'll never make it back in time. I'm desperately trying to find places to insert Toad because after we get to the Jungle Kingdom, he barely feels like a character anymore. Cranky laughs once more and tells them that they have a shortcut they could use, but that they're going to need carts. Okay, so this next scene is definitely more irreverent, yet it's one of the scenes I think I most like in the movie in spite of it, because it's kind of wild that the Kongs are a civilization that not only ride the carts, but make them. And I love that making them is done by customizing them the way you do in Mario Kart 8. And ACDC's Thunderstruck is surprisingly fitting for the scene. It's like the only 80s song I kind of agreed with purely thematically. Well, I guess the Beastie Boys' No Sleep Till Brooklyn was pretty good too, but... Our changes start with Mario, Peach, and Toad are ready to leave when they come across Donkey Kong in a cart of his own, telling Mario that he hates him. Oh yeah? Well, if you hate me so much, you can stay right here. I beat you, I can beat Bowser on my own. That sets DK off, shouting that maybe he will just stay here and let the giant turtle turn him into a roasted weenie. Oh wait, you're already a weenie! Cranky pulls up in his bike and tells his son to simmer down. He can't stay even if he wanted to because he's the one holding the blocks with the power stars. Peach is surprised and asks what Cranky Kong is doing on his bike. Is he coming with them? Cranky starts to laugh, telling them that they didn't think they'd be fighting this monster alone, did they? The camera pans out to reveal an army of Kongs revving their engines. Our heroes are amazed. It's a kind gesture from someone who's kind of been giving them shit this whole time, and that way they get the Power Star, DK, and the army without having to demand both. Bowser's scene with his wedding suit from Odyssey and Kamek dressed up as Peach where Blue Shell interrupts them to inform them that they found where Mario's headed. Perfect! Next! And you know, the Rainbow Road scene is pretty damn good too. There's a weird interaction where DK basically Kong blocks Mario in front of Peach and Toad comes in as a wingman, but I actually kind of like it because it reflects Mario and Peach's relationship in the games. Peach isn't averse to Mario by any means, but it's never fully clear that she has any romantic feelings for him. She doesn't not have feelings for him either, it's just never really explored, and the movie pretty much keeps it that way. Also, when the Koopas ambush the Kongs, you can see that Blue Shell is going a bit nuts when attacking Mario, and it's a little odd because up until now, he's been totally chill, and this is their first encounter with each other. But with our rewrite, especially with Doobie's Sand Kingdom scene, it makes more sense why Blue Shell would be on his last nerve. This whole sequence is supremely well animated and has a lot of good action scenes. I'm not a huge fan of Toad's Now That Is How You Princess line because... What the fuck does that even mean? But other than that, this part is fantastic. Blue Shell's last stand is flying towards DK's cart that Mario managed to hop onto and crashing into them, creating a massive explosion that breaks the Rainbow Road, dropping Mario and DK to their doom. What I like here is that Peach and Toad don't stop. They need to get back to the Mushroom Kingdom and evacuate everyone. 
Mario and DK bicker as they're falling to the water, with DK holding the Power Star block close, until eventually they land in the water, with DK KO'd as Mario needs to valiantly swim in order to save him. I feel like the scene could be a touch more tense, with Mario not being able to swim so well while trying to carry DK up. But in a panic, he finds a question mark block containing a frog suit that makes it easy to swim and carry him back above water. DK comes back too, and is about to thank Mario for saving him when he notices the frog suit. Is... is that a frog suit? Hey, I won't tell anyone I saved you if you don't tell anyone about the suit. Deal. As DK was passed out in the water, both the Power Star blocks as opposed to DK's card in the original fell into the jaws of the terrifying Unagi, who now creates a massive wave that Mario and DK try to swim away from before swallowing them whole. Peach and Toad make their way back to the Mushroom Kingdom and warn the citizens to flee into the forest, since Bowser is coming. This sequence can be largely unchanged too, except for when she gets back into the throne room. Toadsworth is surprised to see only Peach with a random Toad. Where's Master Mario? She admits that they lost Mario, which is met with a gasp. And it was met with a gasp in the original too, which is weird because not only did no one in the Mushroom Kingdom know who Mario even was, but when asked, remember, Peach said he wasn't important. In our rewrite, people would at the least be familiar enough with Mario to know that he was going to help Peach. Not only is Mario gone, but the Kongs were going to help and had to be left behind. And when Mario was lost, the power stars they'd collected were lost with them. The Toads all evacuate except for ours, who Peach insists go with the rest. But Toad reminds her that he promised to protect her in the original movie, which I'm not gonna lie, he hasn't really made good on yet since Peach is usually the one saving him. But in our version, he could tell her something like he's not gonna let her do this alone or something. She agrees to let him stay and the two go out to confront Bowser. The rest of the scene could play out exactly the same, with Bowser professing his love, Peach rejecting him, Kamek torturing Toad as a result, making Peach give in and agree to marry Bowser. This small scene right here is a perfect example of Trey Parker's but because or therefore, even in the original movie. Mario and Peach were taking the Rainbow Road shortcut, but the Koopa Troop found out and were therefore able to ambush them, and because Blue Shell destroyed the road, Peach and Toad were forced to return to the Mushroom Kingdom empty-handed. Therefore, they had to evacuate everyone from the city, but they stayed behind to confront Bowser. He asks Peach to marry him nicely, but she rejects him, therefore he tortures Toad to coerce her. Because of that, Peach agrees to marry him, but they decide to take Toad with them, and that last one's a really weird but, and you'll see why in a bit. As they walk back to Bowser's castle, he demands members of his Koopa troop to locate this kingdom's power star and bring it aboard. Next we have... Not even a Luigi scene, since the only thing he says here is Mario, but a scene with Bowser's prisoners. In this scene, we see the Kong army get imprisoned as well, and while I wouldn't change what happens in this scene, I'd add a little bit more to it. Cranky would turn around and notice Luigi and mistake him for Mario. Luigi's excited to hear that someone here knows Mario and tells him that he's his brother, Luigi. Cranky seems disappointed. Oh, I thought you survived. Survived? Yeah. Your brother and my son fell into the ocean. I don't know if they're okay. Luigi's about to lose all hope, and Egad tries comforting him. Come on, Sonny. If your brother's half as scrappy as you are, I'm sure you'll be okay. The rest of the scene could play out as normal, with Kamek announcing that they'll be part of the royal wedding as a sacrifice. Okay, so I'm not a huge fan of this next scene. Two scenes ago, we had a great narrative structure that complemented itself, even in the context of the original film. Now, we have a scene that just feels so rushed, one has to wonder why they even put it in the goddamn movie. Mario and DK are inside the Unagi, frustrated that this is probably where they're going to die, and lamenting that they feel like failures in the eyes of their fathers. A lot of people say that they like that they didn't use this moment to make Mario and DK friends, and that DK remains nasty towards Mario even at their lowest. And in a way, I agree. I think it would have been a pretty cliche way of going about it, and I like that they retain the rivalry, but what I dislike is that they play the moment for laughs. The movie is weirdly more sympathetic to Donkey Kong in this scene than it is to Mario, who's our main character. And it's especially weird because it's followed by another somewhat serious instance of DK being enraged by something Mario said. When DK's the one berating Mario when he was down, it's all fun and games, but the second Mario says that he should go in a corner and smash things because he's a smash monkey, he gets angry and says that he's more than a guy who smashes things, which... 
I love that they present this as an insecurity that Donkey Kong has, but the movie doesn't do anything to prove otherwise. Aside from driving a go-kart, all we've seen DK do is smash things and maybe be a bit of a showman during the fight, but is that something he aspires to be? It's never quite explored, and much like Peach's backstory, it's something that could be expanded upon in a sequel but doesn't really have a place here. Something else I don't like about this scene is that Mario and DK don't really do anything that leads them to finding the cart with a rocket barrel that gets them out of the Unagi. I guess you could argue that DK thrashing about made the Unagi burp, but it didn't read like that the first time I watched this movie because I figured that the burp was just a fortunate coincidence that helped them find the cart. Maybe in our version, another reason DK feels ashamed about his father thinking he was a joke was because he lost his kingdom's power star. Maybe the two try to one-up each other's regrets, with DK saying he can't believe this is how things are going to end, with him being a disappointment to his kingdom over losing the power star. Mario says that at least he didn't lose his brother to a giant turtle. Yeah, well, at least you're not going to die with your dad thinking you're a joke. My dad thinks I'm a joke too. Yeah, well, your dad's right. So is yours, idiot and overall smash monkey. We could keep the internalized shame as well as the comedic nature of the scene by having it be more rapid fire. They set up the scene as if it's going to be an emotional one and then pull out the rug from underneath us by suddenly trying to make it funny, but I think that's what makes the scene feel unfocused. The mood whiplash doesn't really make it funnier, it just makes it more jarring. At least to me, I know a lot of people find this scene funny, and I'm not trying to be the funny police here, I just think I would have liked the scene to be more tonally consistent. After this exchange, DK could threaten to fight Mario again and tell him that there are no power-ups to save him this time. DK throws a punch and Mario manages to dodge, landing a hit on the Unagi's inner walls. This causes it to growl in pain, which Mario and DK react to. Mario scrambles to tell DK to wait a moment, to stop trying to fight him, and to punch the Unagi again. DK thinks about it and realizes what Mario's plan is. So he's showing off for Mario and delivers some more powerful punches to its stomach lining, which causes it to get sick and resurface to spit them out. As they're once again falling through the air, they realize they really didn't think this one through, but that on the bright side, the blocks with the power stars were spit out along with them. DK manages to grab one, but the other's a little far away from where they are, so Mario asks how they plan on reaching it. DK looks at Mario for a second, and we smash cut to Mario being flung at the block by DK's arm, and with Mario catching it effortlessly. We can have tense moments undercut by comedy, but those moments need to be used sparingly and chosen carefully because the comedy should be a point of levity in a scene, not really a punchline. It's funny that DK uses Mario as a baseball to catch the block, but more importantly, Mario caught the block. They land back in the water, and while glad that they didn't lose the power stars, Mario stresses out over how to get back to the Mushroom Kingdom. I understand why they use the second rocket barrel from DK's cart to get back, but I always thought it was just a little silly that not only were they able to control the barrel perfectly, not only did they know which way they were going after getting swallowed by the Unagi, but that the barrel had just enough fuel to make it back to the Mushroom Kingdom comfortably. Instead, I think they could have used yet another familiar face from Mario's world to get where they needed to go. Maybe instead of both of them landing in the water, only DK does and Mario lands on something squishy but firm. He calls out for Donkey Kong and the thing he landed on starts to move. Mario turns to see a creature with a long neck and is terrified, thinking that it's gonna try and eat DK. But surprise, it pulls him out of the water and onto its back. Upon regaining consciousness, DK realizes he knows this creature. Dory, it's good to see you. Dory doesn't speak, but emits a noise that's unintelligible to Mario. DK says that, yeah, you know how dad can be, running a kingdom and all that. Mario asks if DK can understand this thing. DK says that, yeah, he and Dory go way back. I think this could be a fun little reference to how Donkey Kong has his animal buddies in the Donkey Kong Country series while keeping with the theme of Mario-specific characters. Mario asks Dory if he can help them get back to the Mushroom Kingdom. DK looks at Mario annoyed, saying that he'll ask the questions around here. He asks Dory if he can help him get back to the Mushroom Kingdom, and Dory nods, swimming as fast as it can. I like the idea of DK getting them out of this situation, but in the original, it isn't really because of anything he really does. It's more just a very fortunate coincidence. Here, DK's strength and connections are what allow them to get back on track. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I think adding Dory is a little out of left field, but I do like it more than relying on something as unpredictable as a rocket barrel. 
This is especially true in the original when DK says that now he and Mario are even, but he doesn't really do anything to save Mario, at least not intentionally. I'm pretty sure Mario could have ridden the rocket barrel on his own, but him saying it to Mario in a rewrite makes more sense because of the things that only he would have been able to do for them. Okay, that was a rant and a half, so let's move on to the next scene, which is also one I would change up a little bit. The whole presentation of the wedding itself is great. I love seeing the King's Boo and Babam cameos, even though I do wish they had done something with them outside of that. Like, they kinda do with King Babam, but he feels more like a prop than a character. I love seeing Bowser's minions bringing wedding gifts and that one Koopa trying to steal the coin, that's pretty funny. I would add that the four power stars Bowser's collected so far are on full display, maybe at the altar. The one thing I thought that was pretty fucking stupid about this scene is that we see Peach in her wedding dress and then Toad just casually walks in and gives her her bouquet, which we later find out is hiding an ice flower. And it's stupid for a number of reasons. For one, why in the lethal lava land would they let Toad just walk about and visit the princess freely? Her condition for marrying Bowser was for him to not hurt any of the Toads, but there was no reason to bring our Toad aboard, much less to allow him to see the princess. Princess? Where did he even get the ice flower? Are you telling me that they didn't confiscate his stuff? Or that he found it at Bowser's Keep and they just let him roam unsupervised? I doubt it considering that Peach tries to make him hide when the doors open, so what, he just managed to escape from the guards? Okay, sure, would've loved to see that, but whatever. Another reason I think this is stupid is because it makes the whole setup of the wedding scene pointless because she punches Kamek and immediately calls the wedding off. There is zero tension in this scene because Peach was never in danger. Not only that, but the whole crux of the scene happening in the first place was so that her subjects would be kept alive. That was part of the compromise. Peach was supposed to be powerless against this. Now, what's stopping the Koopa Troop from killing our Toad? From killing all the Toads? From destroying the Mushroom Kingdom? I don't mind that Peach is a badass in this movie. I mind that she wins every single time. There's not a moment in this movie where she needs anybody's help. Even her wanting help from the Kong army seems ridiculous now because she's just straight up attacking Bowser in front of the Koopa troop. I get that she's desperate, but this is a really stupid decision that jeopardizes her entire kingdom, but she also could have made this choice earlier. What, she couldn't have grabbed a power-up on her way out earlier when confronting Bowser for the first time? Honestly, this would have been a terrific opportunity for Mario to actually save Peach and invoke Bowser's ire, but no. Not only does Mario technically never save Peach in this movie, but later on they have the gall to make Bowser say that it was Mario who ruined his wedding. And, uh, no? Mario wasn't even the one to interrupt the damn thing. By the time he showed up, Bowser was already frozen. And I get it, he's blaming Mario because he sees Mario as the reason Peach doesn't want to be with him, but come on, you gotta give him a better reason than that. On top of that, Bowser's army just sit around like doofuses, allowing her to not only encase their king in ice, but to stop the prisoners from being sacrificed. And you could say that it's because they're afraid to fight Peach, but that's not the case. After she freezes the chain from lowering the prisoners, that's when they bum rush her. Uh, a little too late for that one. Like, literally, all they had to do was let Donkey Kong and Mario show up at the Mushroom Kingdom, cause a riot, thus distracting people from the wedding, have that be what infuriates Bowser, gives Peach some hope, and we still get the badass scene with Mario and DK running through the Mushroom Kingdom with their power-ups. And you know what? You could totally still have a scene where Toad helps Peach with an ice flower. Kamek could still have Toad tied up with magic, forcing him to watch his princess marry the Koopa King. But when Mario and DK crash the wedding, Kamek gets distracted and is sent to deal with the two, and in all the chaos, forgets he was holding on to Toad. Toad can then sneak by, go to the table with all the wedding gifts, which was established in the original movie, and break open one of the power-up blocks and use the ice flower himself. He could stop the chain, which everyone attending reacts to. Since the wedding's already been stopped, this could give Peach the time to spring into action alongside Toad and give her another ice flower too, which she then uses to restrain Bowser. You see what I mean by Toad just kind of being forgotten during this? He's a brave little dude, and it's not like Toads can't use power-ups. Another little thing I want to point out is just how many times they repeat the really? no. joke in this movie. Once with Mario asking Peach if she was really letting him join her to stop Bowser. Once with Peach asking Cranky Kong if it was really that easy that he was just going to lend his army. And now again with Mario asking if DK really thought his Tanuki suit looked cool. 
It's such a non-joke, and there's not a single time it's funny, but they keep doing it. We see the whole scene with Mario using a mushroom and DK using a fire flower. It's a cool scene, if a little frantic and hard to read in my opinion, but at the same time, I don't know how you would slow it down and still make it work. The whole point is to try to climb Bowser's keep as fast as they can, I just wish I could see more fire DK, you know? But anyway, Bowser gets the tanuki suit, they fly up to the wedding venue, and we see that the ice is breaking on the chain, which DK manages to stop just in time, just like in the original movie. Luigi and Egad are close to the lava, but Luigi has a last minute idea. He uses the poltergust to suck and blow, swinging their cage away from harm, allowing him to save the professor. But as the cage swings back, the chain breaks and Luigi's falling to his death. Just in the nick of time, Tanuki Mario swoops in to save his little brother. The two hug, and I love the little comment Luigi makes about Mario wearing some sort of bear costume, especially because DK called it a raccoon suit earlier. Speaking of Donkey Kong, he grabs Cranky's cage and upon his release, admits is very proud of his son, telling him as much. The prisoners are saved and everyone thinks the battle against Bowser is won. Egat notes that with the power stars Mario and DK brought with them, along with the ones in Bowser's possession, it was time to take them back to their respective kingdoms and restore the ones he destroyed. Peach is surprised, asking if that was really possible. All the now-released prisoners are jumping for joy, and we get to the scene where Bowser sees Mario and Peach looking at each other and loses it, managing to free himself by spewing flames. He commands that the Bomber Bill be launched and destroy the Mushroom Kingdom! I actually didn't know it was called a Bomber Bill until I rewatched the movie and thought they had mistakenly called it a Bullet Bill, but apparently Bonsai Bills are called Bomber Bills in English translations of Japanese Mario websites. It's not a bad name. I guess I've just called them Bonsai Bills my whole life, so another name is just weird to me. I wouldn't necessarily change it, I just thought it was an interesting detail. This next sequence is a tough one, partly because I think it's silly, but also because I'm struggling to find a way to do it better. Because I like the idea of Bowser saying screw it and actually trying to destroy the Mushroom Kingdom, and I like the idea of Mario having to redirect the Bomber Bill elsewhere, but I don't really like the way those events play out. Like, the way Mario gets the bill to chase him is by poking its eye with a tail swipe. How the hell did he know that was gonna work? That was a huge gamble! And then when the bomber chases Mario, Mario seems to have a pretty good handle of the Tanuki suit just out of nowhere. Not the biggest deal in the world, but that was a little hard to believe when he was still struggling to properly fly not too long ago. Then there's the issue of Mario guiding the bomber bill to the warp pipe he arrived in, which if you thought poking its eye was a gamble, Mario won the fucking lottery with this plan because he couldn't have possibly known that that was going to explode in there or where it would end up at all. What if it made it to the other side and blew up Brooklyn? Ooh, hold on. What if... Okay, how about this? Everyone's shocked at the bomber build being launched, but Luigi has an idea. But for it to work, he needs Mario to fly him close to it. Mario's a little worried, but he's never seen Luigi so determined. So he flies with Luigi grabbing onto him. What's the plan, Lou? If I use this vacuum, I can stop it from destroying the kingdom! A vacuum? Are you nuts? Trust me on this! So they fly to the top of the bomber bill as it's on its way down to Peach's castle, and we can see that the poltergust is working overtime, slightly slowing the bill down. But it's not enough, Luigi points out. He can't suck it up. And so Mario comes to a realization. If they keep at it, they'll stop it, but it'll fall on the castle and destroy it. Or they could move it away from the castle and slow it down safely. Mario notices that as the bomber bill flew through the air, its eye was getting watery, meaning those eyes are unprotected, cluing him in as to what he could do. He flies down to the bomber bill's eye and tail whips it like he does in the movie, and instead of choosing to chase Mario instead, the bomber bill starts flailing about in pain over his eye. Now's our chance! It's flying away from the kingdom fortunately, but now they have to chase it! Mario flies, Luigi tries to use the poltergust, but Mario notices that it's heading towards the pipe he came out of. Oh no, if it reaches that pipe, it could end up in Brooklyn. Come on, Luigi, you gotta slow it down! So Luigi keeps a steady aim and slowly but surely manages to slow the bomber build down enough to safely stop it. He did it! Mario celebrates him and everyone breathes a sigh of relief, thinking this whole mess is over. And then, we hear a sound we normally enjoy hearing. The creeping sound of a pipe being entered. The bomber bill was close enough to the warp pipe to be sucked in, and the scene plays out normally with the bill exploding within the warp zone. Mario and Luigi are blown away, with Mario losing his tanuki suit after being hit at the side of Bowser's keep. Meanwhile, DK catches Luigi in midair, protecting him from further harm, but we see as the warp zone starts to suck in the entire kingdom. 
There's a really small scene showing Mario and Luigi's family at dinner again, and I would have loved it if they showed a little concern for them. Because I get it, they're two grown-ass men, but I still think their mama would like to know where they've been the past couple of days. I mean, it has been a couple of days since their adventure started, right? Anyway, Mario gets launched outside a manhole in the middle of Brooklyn, and the following scenes are honestly some of my favorites in the movie. Obviously, we're still going to change a few things here and there, but I think the changes we've already made complement the finale and make it much stronger. I like how the first person Mario runs into when returning to Brooklyn is Spike, who is terrified of seeing Bowser's keep, and we see everyone else from this other world crash into the streets of Brooklyn as well. With them, the six power stars. As Mario looks towards them with a sense of hope, he hears the mighty Bowser's voice screaming his name. He's mortified, but his first instinct is to make a run for the stars. Bowser's too quick, however, and jumps in front of them. I love how terrifyingly enraged Bowser looks in this scene, but I think we should remind the audience that Bowser is still a cocky beast. In this enraged state, he could still look down on Mario and taunt him, telling him that he's conflicted. Because on one hand, you brought me to a whole new world for me to conquer. On top of that, you practically gifted the power stars I didn't have to me. But on the other hand, you ruined my wedding! Like I said earlier, he also claims this in the original, but there, Mario didn't do a damn thing. In our rewrite, there's a little bit more credence to that. And I hadn't noticed this, but in the original movie, Bowser says that he was finally gonna be happy, but now Mario can suffer just like he does, which is an interesting character moment for Bowser. And I think the reason this differs from a moment like Peach's backstory and DK's upset at being a guy who smashes things is because throughout the movie, we can see why Bowser says this. He's a power-hungry king, but at his core, he's lonely. Everything he does in this movie is because he wants Peach to love him back. He was very powerful, yes, but even all the power in the world couldn't get him the one thing he wanted, which was love. He uses his power to obtain more of it and flaunt how powerful he is to Peach. When that doesn't work, he exerts his newly obtained power to coerce Peach into being with him. And in keeping with his twisted view of love, when not even that works, he deflects responsibility and finds someone else to blame, choosing to inflict pain on others so they can be as hurt as he is. He blames Mario not for tearing through his army or for defeating one of his most powerful subordinates, but for ruining his wedding and his chance at happiness. He doesn't care that Mario interfered with his power, he cares that he interfered with his love. Aside from his more explicit insecurities which are played up for laughs, Bowser is the best understood and best portrayed character in this movie, not just by Jack Black, but by the scriptwriters too. Bit of a side note here, when they return to Brooklyn, Luigi hid in a trash can to avoid the falling debris, but I think he should hide inside the Punch-Out Pizzeria where this adventure began. The reason I point this out is because Bowser finally had a chance to face off against Mario and beats the snot out of him, ending with a tail whip that blasts Mario into the pizzeria as well. He crashes into the TV where we saw their commercial, knocking it off the wall where it was. Luigi calls out to Mario and pulls him into where he was hiding, behind the booth next to the Jumpman arcade machine. He frantically asks Mario if he's okay, with his brother not being able to say much due to the pain. Bowser calls out Mario's name to come out and fight him, and he says something in the original movie that I think is kind of weird. He calls him a worthless, weak little nothing, and that part is fine. Reducing Mario and not only making him feel small but meaningless is exactly where Mario's insecurities lie. But then he asks him if he's too afraid to fight, which I think even Bowser knows isn't the case. Mario has faced everything in this movie pretty head on, even without knowing what he was getting himself into. I think asking him if he'd given up would have made more sense, but also might have been too on the nose given what happens in a bit. Instead, I think he should call out to Luigi. What about you, Grease Dash? Or are you too afraid to fight me? Bowser would actually have a bit more personal experience with Luigi and would know he is more fearful. No one responds and Bowser stands tall, realizing his only foes wouldn't fight him. But in come Peach, Donkey Kong, and Toad to continue the fight. As the brothers hear the commotion going on outside, they sit together in their hiding spot. Luigi is feeling hopeless, saying that now, because of their actions, their world was in danger too. They... they should have just given up while they were ahead. Mario says nothing. He's ashamed. Guilty. Not only did he fail to protect the Mushroom Kingdom, but now he's put... Br Mamma mia! 
a portion of their commercial starts to play on the broken television. That's why the Super Mario Brothers are here. Uh, to save Brooklyn. To save Brooklyn. Brooklyn. To save Brooklyn. And just as quickly as the image of the two once ambitious brothers come on screen, it just as quickly cuts away, revealing the reflection of two beaten down siblings, afraid for their lives and their city. This moment is so goddamn good, and it pains me that Luigi isn't here for it. Like, again, it's the Super Mario Brothers movie, but Mario gets all the character development. What, I mean, the little that, it, that there is, I guess. <laughs> Seeing this commercial played back to them in a new light, Mario is determined to face Bowser head on, even despite the beating he took. Luigi is confused at where Mario's going, and while he tries to reach out for him, he doesn't move from his spot. As the princess and Toad are restrained, Donkey Kong is about to take a final punch to the face from Bowser, who lifts the ape off the floor. But Mario speaks up, telling him to leave DK alone. Bowser tosses him aside and tells Mario that he doesn't know when to quit. Yeah, I've been told that before. Now, in the original, Peach takes advantage of the guards being distracted by Mario's presence to attack them and use a Koopa shell to knock the superstar Mario's way. And at that point, it should be a bit obvious as to why I don't like that. I have no problem with Peach being a badass in this movie, but as with anything, too much of something can be a bad thing. Peach is virtually perfect in this movie. She's great at everything, anything she does she does correctly, and anytime someone does get the upper hand on her, oops, no, sorry, I had a plan for that too. And the thing is, it's not like the Koopa Troop are restraining Peach to keep her from running away. She's an ass kicker. They're most likely restraining her to avoid her causing any more harm. And I get that maybe they got distracted because of Mario, but their current task is to restrain Peach. Not to mention, Kamek is guarding the damn thing with magic. How the hell did she get the upper hand even then? <sighs> In any case... It's kind of irrelevant because in our rewrite, none of that matters because there are six of these things in Bowser's possession. Instead, he could taunt Mario one final time. That's one aspect of Bowser and Mario's relationship that I kind of feel went ignored. Bowser loves to smack talk, but he hardly says a word to Mario. He could start laughing, confusing everyone. He turns to Peach with rage in his eyes, asking her if this was her hero. This tiny little human was the one she trained to stand up to him? The Koopa Troop starts laughing with him. Bowser continues by saying that he has the world's most powerful army, alongside six of their power stars. What does he have? A stupid red hat, a big nose, and a mustache. The laughter resonates across the streets of Brooklyn. And as Mario once again begins to feel small, we hear another voice. That's not true! He's also got his brother. Luigi stands tall beside Mario, scared but looking determined to stand up to this menace. Bowser looks over to Luigi and remarks, Cute, but hey Greenstash, are you supposed to be burning alive right now? <sighs> and he lets loose his fire breath with our allies gasping in shock, Peach in particular calling out for the brothers. Mario's face is bracing for impact, but he realizes he's okay. Upon opening his eyes, he sees Luigi, Poltergust in hand, sucking up the fire that Bowser is sending their way. As Mario calls out his brother's name, Luigi echoes Mario's words to him right before they got separated. As long as we're together, nothing can hurt us. As Bowser runs out of flames, he sees the brothers are still standing. Luigi calls out to him, asking him if he'd like a taste of his own medicine. He turns the vacuum to blow and blows Bowser's flames right back at him. He retreats to his shell to shield from it, but Luigi starts to lose control of the poltergust with Mario telling him to stop. But he can't, it, the thing isn't shutting off. Out comes everything that Luigi had sucked up, in particular the chest from the treasure room he and Egad found earlier, hitting Bowser square in the stomach. Out of the chest emerges the seventh and final power star, with all of them floating in the same space. Peach then calls out to Mario, directing his attention to them. He tells Luigi to come with him, and together they leap toward the bunch of power stars. On the floor, Bowser tries to stop them with one final fireball, and as it makes impact, we see dust form around everyone. And just like in the original movie, the dust clears to reveal Mario and Luigi in their invincibility state, flashing the colors of the rainbow. And there isn't a thing I could say that would make the following sequence any better. 
It's super cathartic to watch Mario and Luigi take on the various members of Bowser's army one by one. Luigi saving Spike from the Shy Guys that kidnapped him, the two plowing through the Koopa Troop like their shadow from Sonic 06, it's amazing. Now, you could argue that it doesn't make sense that Luigi would know how to do all these acrobatic things if he didn't train like Mario did, and I agree, but th this is one of those things where the end result is so cool that you kinda end up not really caring. You're just glad he has this moment at all. We can chalk it up to getting powered up by the Power Stars and acting on instinct. I especially love how they mirror Peach's reaction to Mario almost completing the obstacle course, but with their parents, and just like that scene, they get chomped by a piranha plant, a real one this time. Of course, in this case, because they're invincible, they're able to get free and take down Bowser. It's such a well-done sequence, it's borderline choreographed like an anime fight scene. Bowser is defeated and is approached by our other heroes. And with a mini mushroom in hand, Peach shrinks Bowser to the size of a gecko, with Toad trapping him in a jar. I'd make a sea Toad pull out the jar out of his backpack just to keep the backpack relevant. It looks like saying stupid obvious shit runs in the Royal Kong family because in the original, DK points out how Bowser got the blue mushroom, which I guess is technically a callback to when it happened to Mario, but much like Cranky's line earlier, yeah, we can see that. You don't need to point it out. Another thing I think I'd change is what Mario and Luigi's dad says to Mario. Or, excuse me, I wouldn't change what he says, rather, I'd change who he says it to. In the original, he only says that Mario's amazing while their mother hugs the both of them. What the hell, Mario's dad? You realize you're Luigi's dad too, right? <laughs> I love that Spike is the one cheering for them the loudest, and instead of a reference to that damn dog Francis, we get a shot of Mayor Pauline giving the brothers an approving nod. And I don't mind the ending too, though I do think it's a little odd. Mario and Luigi wake up in the room and get ready for another workday, and it's revealed that they live in the Mushroom Kingdom now. They take a pipe, and I'm guessing it's open to interpretation, but I always thought is, oh, they're still plumbers, so I guess they're going back to Brooklyn for work? I mean, in that case, why not just stay in Brooklyn? The only thing I change here is that they would do another run through the kingdom, saying hi to their friends before reaching the pipe. Toad, Egad, DK, Peach, throw in Lumily, why not? And in all honesty, we can keep the mid and post credit sequences the way they are. One's a cute little sequence of what happened to Bowser, while the other is setting up a sequel with Yoshi involved, and that's perfectly fine. I think that throughout the script writing process, I realized that I liked the elements that made up the Super Mario Bros. movie more than the end product. My opinion of the movie has only changed slightly since I first watched it. Certain things that once irked me I don't mind as much, some of the things that bothered me at first bothered me more, and there were even certain things I didn't pay much mind to the first time around that upon repeat viewings made me question how they didn't bother me the first time. All in all, I think tweaking certain elements here and there elevates the Super Mario Bros. movie from a fun, colorful, action-packed movie with a substandard story that I didn't care to watch more than once to a film with a simple yet effective story that explores the characters in a way that the games aren't particularly interested in doing that I would love to watch over and over until the sequel comes out. Hopefully I'm right about some of the elements in the movie that seem like they're planned to be explored in a sequel, but I suppose only time will tell. Until then, I'd love to know what you thought of this rewrite in the comments. I know it was far from perfect, but it wasn't really supposed to be. My goal was only to give this movie the story I believe it deserved, and hopefully I've done that in your eyes as well. Thank you for watching all the way through the end. I know that was a lot to take in. I'd appreciate it if you all would drop a like on this video, subscribe if you haven't if you'd like to, and share it with anyone you think might find it interesting. Thank you, as always, to my patrons and channel members. On screen, you're seeing the names of the lovely people who choose to financially contribute to content like this, and if you'd like to join them, you can check out the link in the description or hit that join button below the video. Videos like this are brought to you in part by them, and I appreciate their support immensely. It's really hard to come up with all these drawings, to, you know, work really hard writing the script, doing the acting. I've been recording for like two, almost and a half hours now. And so it means the world to me to have people financially support this because it takes a while and, and that takes resources away from making other videos. And so like, obviously if you'd like to, I would appreciate any financial support that you can just because it, it makes making content like this more rewarding for me. I love doing stuff like this. It really, really stretches my creative muscles and I really think that I need more of that. <laughs> Obviously, you are in no way obligated to do this. I appreciate you guys.
just watching just by itself. But I do encourage you to check that out. I'm, I'm really bad about like updating people with what I'm doing, but I do try my best to get these videos out a day early for people who support me more directly financially. And regardless, again, I thank you for watching. I appreciate their support and I appreciate your support even if you don't decide to financially contribute directly. Take care of yourselves, be kind to others and yourself. Stay safe and stay awesome. This is Charai5, signing off.